Amen. Amen. All right. Welcome to the house. Uh, today, by the grace of God, I have a message for you titled, When You Can't See God's Finger, Trust His Heart. When you can't see God's finger, trust His heart. Now, peradventure, you've gone through situations before that made you to ask questions. Is God, are you there? Or maybe you've asked yourself, why am I going through this situation? Why is this happening to me? Uh, maybe you've prayed and it seems as if there's no answer and you start wondering, does God really answer prayers? Is God right there? You know, or maybe um, you're just thinking that um, does it mean God has forgotten you? Uh, I have a good news for you this morning that when you can't see God's finger walking things around for you, please trust his heart because God is still working. The Lord Jesus Christ says in John chapter 5, verse 17, John chapter 5, verse 17, he says, my father is always working and so I am. So be assured that God is still on the throne and he is working. Hallelujah. Now, our text for, the, for today is taken from the book of Jeremiah chapter 29. But before we go to that text, I want to give you a back, background so that you understand and flow with me. Once upon a time, um, the children of God, including their king, uh, this was during the reign of King Jeconiah. If you know him, King Jeconiah, that was during the, his reign and um, uh, Babylon, the king of Babylon invaded Israel and conquered everyone, including the king, the elder, the prophet, and everybody. And they were taken into captivity. So they were in captivity. And then, of course, they offended God. Remember that anytime Israel offended God, when his children offended them, him, he sanctioned them. So he sanctioned them, and they were taken to captivity. So while in captivity, God now spoke to his prophet, prophet Jeremiah, and gave prophet Jeremiah an, a message for the people. So he told prophet Jeremiah to tell them certain things. So prophet Jeremiah wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to the children of God in Babylon. He told them, he said, um, of course, that was to encourage them not to despair, not to distress, not to be anxious or be afraid for anything. So he told them that um, God has good plan for them, that God has not forgotten them, and that God has a future and a hope for them. Okay, So he told them that uh, rather than being anxious or despair, he told them to build houses. He said, go ahead, build houses, get married, have children, plant gardens and eat of the food of the garden and also find spouses for your children and multiply and increase. And also that they should not worry because God has a plan for them and God has promised that he will visit them and he will fulfill all the promises that he has made concerning them. Okay. And so he wrote the letter and I told them. And also another thing he told them is that God said, their captivity was going to be for 70 years. So he told them it was going to be 70 years. So let's now, I've given you the background. Now let us read our text. It's Jeremiah chapter 29 from verses 8 to 14. Jeremiah 29 verses 8 to 14. And if you have it on your, you have your Bible on your phone, it's good to read it with me or you can read it on the screen. So it says, this is what um, the Lord of heaven's I mean, the God of Israel says, do not let your prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. Verse 10. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised, and I will bring you home again. Verse 12, 
says, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortune. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. So you can see that God reassured them, though you are in captivity, but God says they should not despair, that there is future for them, there is hope for them. I have good news for someone here today that it does not matter what you are going through right now or what you are expecting from God. Be assured that there is an expiry date for whatever you are going through. And there is a delivery date for what you are expecting. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. You receive it. Now, from that passage that you read, there are three things that you will learn. One thing is that God says the captivity was going to be for 70 years. So which means their captivity had an expiry date. So that would give them confidence because when you know that what you are going through has a, an expiry date, then you can settle down and, you know, you can settle down and do things that you need to do. You won't be bothered. You won't be distressed. You won't be anxious for nothing because you know that it's a set date for what you are going through to expire or for what you are expecting to come. So that should give every believer, every child of God, an assurance that whatever you are going through, keep doing what you are doing. Just live your life as normal. Whatever it is, is going to pass, and whatever you are expecting, you are going to receive. Now, the second thing is that it told them that God had good plans for them, he had planned for of a good future for them. And we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that means God does not change. If God does not change, his word does not change. So whatever he told one applies to the other. So what I'm saying is whatever God said previously, God loved the children of Israel. They offended him. He led the king of Babylon to take them into captivity. Yes, yet because of that love, he sent a prophet to them and to tell them that, don't worry, this captivity has an expiry date. Not only that, that he had a future for them, he had a hope for them. So you know as well that God has a future for every one of us. The third one is told them, it says that they must pray. I'm sure you read that. It said, they must pray. Say, when you pray, I will listen. Say, when you search for me, I will be found. So that means that though they were in captivity, even though God already promised, give them an assurance that the captivity will end in 70 years and he will do what he promised them, he still told them that they must do what they must pray. And they must seek him. So that tells me that, yes, God might have promised us that things will be well, all will be okay, don't be anxious for nothing, but we still have to pray. We still have to search him. Good. So, now, it's possible that you are someone that is, you know, struggling to trust God because... You want a logical and rational approach to life. It's possible you are here. And maybe possibly you are looking for some scientific, maybe scientific verifiable and consistent facts to support your faith. You can ask God. If there's any such person here or anyone listening to me, you are struggling with your faith. You are finding it difficult, you know, to trust God because you are somebody that reasons logically. You can ask God and ask God, can you explain certain things to me, certain things that I do not understand? And I'm sure that God will explain to you. I am sure that he will explain to you because he won't give you a knock on the head. He did not give Moses a knock on the head. When he was speaking with Moses in the wilderness, Moses said to him, can I see your glorious presence? And God did not knock him on the head. God just said, okay, I will show you a bit. So he kept him and covered his 
face when he passed, and he said, now you can see my back. So God will always show you a bit. I know you, we cannot understand everything about God. It's a mystery, okay? And Apostle Paul was a man who walked with God, and he shares part of his experience with us. If you would turn to Romans chapter 11, uh, chapter 33, this is the way it captures it. It says in verse 33, Oh, how great God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. He was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was the one that prayed that I may know, know him more. He wanted to know God more. He tried as much as possible to acquire knowledge of God. But at the end of the day, he tells you, say, you guys, you know, you guys is... It's, it's impossible for us to understand his decisions and his ways. So you will find that it is enough for us to know uh, that whatever he does or permit to do is good. That, that's all. That's good enough for us. All we just need to know is that, and we should believe that whatever God does or whatever he allows to happen is for our own good. And this is how Apostle Paul again put it in Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So he says, look, I've tried as much as possible to know this God, but it's impossible to understand him. But one thing that I know that I can tell you, this is Apostle Paul now speaking, that we should just know that all things work together for our good. That's all. If we know that, then that is all. And of course, if you still want more biblical backing to what I'm telling you, you can look at Isaiah chapter, Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 to 9. God was speaking to the prophet Isaiah, and the prophet Isaiah wrote, he says, God says to him, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. See, so we cannot, verse 9, it says, for just as the heaven are higher, than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So you can see that all we need to do is to take a cue from what the Lord Jesus Christ told the ruler of the synagogue. You remember what he told him? He said, do not be afraid, just believe. You remember? Do not be afraid, just believe. That was the ruler of the synagogue. When he, was, when he told Jesus to come to his house to heal the servant that was, that was sick, and somebody, a message came from his house that the girl had died. And when Jesus Christ heard, he just turned to the ruler and said, mm -mm, do not be afraid, just believe. So the same thing, that is the same thing we just have to learn from that and say, guess what, do not be afraid, all you need to do is to, is to believe. And also, not only does, does God make all things to work together for a good, He also makes things to happen at the appropriate time. He makes things beautiful for His own time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Yet God had made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to the end. So you can see what it means by God has made all things beautiful for its own time. He's saying that things happen to us at the time when it will make sense. So God makes things to happen in our life at the time when it will make sense. And we have some examples, some instances of our brothers and sisters who experience God and who can, we can learn from their stories, the stories told by their lives, which says that when we cannot see, it helps us to understand that when we cannot see fingers of God working in our lives, in our situation, we should trust the heart of God, that he has a plan for us, he has a future for us. If you have time, I have five of them here. But if, if we don't have time, I can skip. But let's look at uh, our friend, our brother called Joseph. Now, you know that Joseph went from one undesirable you know, situation to another. 
He was kept in the pit by his brother. And um, when he was brought out from the pit, it was as if he was going to be released to go home. There was hope for him. But again, they sold him into slavery. See? And when they sold him into slavery, he was sold into the, house, into the home of Potiphar. When he got to the home of Potiphar, he thought that, oh, there's hope. Because for 11 years, he lived in the house of Potiphar. And he was the head of the slave. He was the master slave. So he was enjoying himself. So at least life was better for him in the house of Potiphar. Potiphar until Potiphar's wife lied against him. And then he was thrown into the prison. So when he was in the prison, he met the cup bearer. When he met the cup bearer and the cup bearer was released, another ray of hope came to him. And he thought, well, maybe he would not die in the prison. But he had to wait another two years for anything to happen. But guess what? All along, it, Joseph knew what we know now, that when we can't see God's finger, we should trust God's heart. All the while he was trusting God's heart, he knew that God was working something out for him. And I can tell you, when he did not die in the pit, and he survived it. Of course, he knew God must have a plan for his life. When he got to Potiphar's house and he lived there for 11 years, and the wife of Potiphar lied against him and he was thrown into the prison, and Potiphar did not cut off his head, of course, he must know that God still had him in mind. And when he met the call bearer and he was released from prison, then it dawned on him that indeed God meant everything for good, everything that happened in his life. So, you can see that Joseph trusted God, and that was the best decision, I believe, he ever made. To trust God and not to relent in believing in his dream, because eventually he became the prime minister in the land of Egypt, because he did not give up hope, because he did not give up his trust in God. Another thing that the account of Joseph teaches us is that God makes things beautiful in its, for its own time. Because the time that God released Joseph from prison, that he became the prime minister, that was the time there was a famine in the land of Canaan. And his people, his family, would have died of famine if at that point in time, he was not the one that was in control of the affair of Egypt. He was in control of the economy of Egypt. So you can see that whatever he went through for good 13 years, God was working things out for him, was directing his path so that he can get to where God has destined for him to be. So may I tell you, when you can't see God's finger, would you still trust God's heart, that's a, question, that's a question for you. Now, let's talk about David. Now, when I look at this story of David, I'm always amused. This was a young shepherd boy. He did not bargain to become a king. They called him from the forest to be anointed king. And when he became king, trouble began. But David knew what we know now. That when you can see God's finger, trust his heart. Because everything was as if things were not going well for, 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 for David. At a point in his life, in Psalm 8 verse 4, Psalm 8 verse 4, David said, What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? So that tells you that despite what David was going through, he was being hunted by King Saul. He was going from one cave to the other in the wilderness. He was still mindful of the fact that God was thinking about him, that it, you can trust God even if you cannot see the hand of God. And when he had the time, he has the opportunity to strike and kill King Saul. Do you know that? He did not kill King Saul. 1 Samuel chapter 26, verse 10. 1 Samuel 26, verse 10. David said, As the Lord live, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die. 
or he shall go out to battle and perish. In other words, David was saying, I would rather follow God's plan for my life. God has a plan. I'm not going to take things into my hand. I would rather wait. See, this was Saul who was looking to kill him, to destroy him. And he had an opportunity to kill Saul. But because he believed so much in God's plan, he believes that God had a plan, had a future for him. So he would rather wait for that plan. And there was also when King Saul was killed, when he eventually died, David did not rush to the throne. He went back to God and asked God, God, what next do I do? Second Samuel chapter 12 verse 1. Second Samuel chapter, chapter 2, verse 1, sorry. It says, it happened that David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go to any cities of Judah? That was after Saul died. And the Lord said to him, go up. David said, where shall I go up? And God said to Hebron. And he went to Hebron, and the people of Judah came to him and anointed him as king. What am I saying? Everything that um, David went through for those years, he knew that God had a plan. Though he did not see the finger of God working in his case, but he still trusted God's heart. So my question is to you is this. When you do not see God's finger in your situation, would you still trust God's heart? Would you still wait for God's plan or will you go ahead of God the next person is Ruth you must have read about Ruth Ruth was a Moabite she was married to um, an a Jew an Israelite unfortunately the husband died the husband brother died the father-in-law died it was as if everybody in the family died and she had no child with the husband. So she was alone with the mother-in-law. One would have thought that such a woman would not believe the God of Israel, the God of his husband. Didn't you think? Don't you think? If you were in her shoes and the family were worshiping a God, the husband died, the father-in-law died, the brother died, would you not doubt that God or would you trust that God? Which one? Trust. You still trust that God? Yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, because your faith has <laughs> increased. Ordinarily, a woman of such, a Moabite, would say, look, we have our own idols. If this God could save, why did he not save these people? But no. She trusted the God of Israel. She believed that even though she could not see the finger of God in her situation, but she trusted his heart. Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. This is what she said to the mother-in-law. Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God, that God that you serve, will still be my God. Whether the husband died, the brother-in-law, it does not matter. She believed that she could still trust the heart of that God. And I believe that was the most vital, the most important decision that Ruth made in her life. Why? Because indeed God had a plan, had plans for her in Israel. God had a future for her in Israel. She got to Israel, she remarried to Boaz, who was a wealthy and influential man. She had a child, Obed, with Boaz. Obed was the great grandfather of King David. King David was the great grandfather of Jesus. So she became an ancestor of Jesus. Now, you are following this account. One would have been, she would have been discouraged. She would have thought, no, I don't think this God is real. Why would I be going through these issues? And the same thing might be happening in your life, on the life of anyone that you know. That God, does God truly really hear me? I've prayed, I've prayed, 
I've done, I've fasted. It seems as if nothing is happening. But the truth is this. You can always trust God's heart, even if you cannot see his fingers. God is always walking. He's still walking. He hasn't stopped. It's just that that problem has an expiry date. If you can just stay on, it will expire. And if you are the one that has prayed and you are expecting, you believe God heard you and you are expecting things to happen and it seems as if nothing is happening, I have a good news for you as well. That thing that you are expecting has a due date, a delivery date, and it will be delivered in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now, what about Elizabeth? Elizabeth, of course, you know, Elizabeth um, was the wife of Zechariah. The scripture says, in God's high, they were righteous. So they were righteous people. And because they were righteous people, one would think that, you know, they should be fruitful. They, they, she shouldn't be childless. But she was childless. Despite the fact that she was childless, she still trusted God. Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 6. Luke chapter 1, verses um, 5 to 6. Of course, it says, in the days of Herod, there was this man, Zechariah, and his wife was Elizabeth. Go to the next verse. And it says, they were righteous before God. They were walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. So these are people that were blameless. These are the people that God says they are righteous. But yet they were expecting to receive the fruit of the womb. But the lady, the woman was not pregnant. You see? But a time came when God visited her and God told her that she was going to carry John the Baptist. And the scripture says, the Lord Jesus Christ himself even confirmed that Jesus, uh, that John the Baptist was the greatest of all men. Luke chapter 7 verse 28. The Lord Jesus Christ says, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is no greater, than pro- no greater prophet than John the Baptist. That's what, that was the child that God gave to Elizabeth. So you can see that if it seems as if God is doing nothing, nothing is happening, you can be assured that God is working. God has a purpose for you. He has a future for you. He has plans for you. And he also has the timing. He knows the best that he wants things to happen for you. Time that things will make sense. So you can see that it made sense now. Reading back, we can see why God closed her womb. Because God was going to give her a man that will be the greatest of all men. Daniel. Of course, we know Daniel. Daniel was a noble, handsome, gifted, knowledgeable, intelligent, and quick to learn man. Of course, we know that Daniel grew up in royalty. You know, it was he grew up in royalty. But then they went into captivity. The king of Babylon again came, conquered them. They were taken into captivity. Then when they were in captivity, he did well. He was promoted. He became a governor. In, in, in captivity. And all of a sudden, there were some people against him. They made the king to make a law that nobody should pray to any god except the king for 30 days. Now, Daniel would rather obey God than obey them, than obey the law. So he decided to disobey the law. So he refused to pray to the king and he prayed to God. When the, when the king knew about it, he took the king a whole day to decide on the punishment. Remember that the punishment was new. The sanction was known, sorry. The sanction was known by the people because the king made the law that anybody that refused to pray to him would be thrown in the den of lion. So for the whole day, Daniel had an opportunity to change his mind. If you read that account, the king was, wanted to help him so he waited. It was late in the evening that the king said, okay, go and throw Daniel into the den of the lion. So the king gave him an opportunity to deny his faith. But he knew what we know now, that even though he did not see the hand of God, that the king had not changed his mind, he was still going to be thrown into the lion's den. He did not change his mind. While he was being matched, 
to the den of the lions. He still did not change his mind. But guess what? God was working when he did not see it. When he did not see the hand of God working, God was already working. He already tamed the lion. So by the time he got down there, the lion were friendly. They were just looking at him. Who asked you to come here? What are you doing here? You are not supposed to be here. When, when you are done, you get out of this place and let, them, let real meat come for us to eat. So you, you understand now that God is always working. I'm, tell, I'm giving all these examples so that we know. You see, the accounts in the Bible, they are not given to us for entertainment. They are not just stories for children's bedtime stories. No, they are for us to understand and to trust that there is a God that you can trust even if you do not see him or you do not see his hand working. Also, apart from the fact that God saved Daniel, God also used what happened to glorify himself. See? It is true that God may not always calm the storm, but he will always use the storms for his purpose. And that is what Ezra did in this, in this situation. He did not stop the storm. He did not stop Daniel from being thrown into the den. He was thrown into the den. He was brought out. But then God became glorified in the land of Babylon. Daniel chapter 6 verse um, 26. The king made a decree that everyone throughout his kingdom should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel. So now you understand that God may not calm the storm in your life, but he will always use that storm to fulfill his purpose. Amen. Amen. All right. Now, I want you to take this home. There are certain certain seven truths that I'm going to tell you today in rounding up. And I want you to take this seventh thing home. Don't forget, okay? Number one, trust God regardless of your circumstances. And remember that it will never fail, okay? God's presence is always with you no matter how you may feel. He's always with you. He has plans and a good future for you. Do you understand that? Have you written it down? You need to know this. Blessed are you if you know this and you believe it. God's presence is always with you. No matter how you feel, it's always with you. He has plans for you and a future. Number two, now, I cannot tell you whether God causes storms or he permits them. Because you may want to ask me, does God cause storm or does he permit them? I cannot tell you. But one thing you can count on, on is this. God may not calm the storm when it rises, but God will use the storm to fulfill his purpose. Number three. No matter how terrible it may seem in the moment, God always has a higher and good purpose for you because he loves you more than you can imagine. No matter how terrible the moment may be, remember that God has a higher plan and a good purpose for you because he loves you more than you can imagine. Number four, having Jesus in the boat beside you does not mean the storm won't rock your boat. It only means that the storm won't sink your boat. No matter what, you will reach your destination. Amen? Amen. Amen. Number five, all the same, do not put your hope in the boat. Put your hope in the Lord. Trust him for your future. Trust him for the future of your children. Trust him for your future spouse. Trust him with your career. 
Trust him with your business. Trust him with your health. Trust him with that reservation. Trust him with your life. When you do not see his finger, trust his heart. Amen. Number six, decide today. No matter what happens, no matter what life throws to you, even when you cannot see the finger of God, trust his heart. That is number six. I'm going to do examples, but I'm going to ask us to name all the six. Now, before I tell you number seven, I have a clip for you, but don't play the clip yet. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to be sincere. Would you rather take a million dollar now? If I offer you one million dollar, would you rather take it now? This is a good question, especially for those who are real investors. If you're an investor, you know how to invest, do business, you'll be able to get this answer. Would you rather take one million dollars now or you take one cent? Doubled per day for 30 days. <laughs> one cent. If you take one cent per day, raise up your hand. Okay. One, two, three. Come and see so that they see your face. <laughs> Do you still want come and see here so that there's no... You want, to, you want to join her? <laughs> if you would rather take one million dollars now, raise up your hand. Oh, no, no, no. You are, you are, not, be, you are not being sincere here. You should, be, you should vote for one or the other. Let me start again. Will you take one cent a day, double every day for 30 days? Raise up your hand if yes. I'm sorry? Okay, I give you one cent now. Tomorrow, I give you two cent. The other day, I give you three cent. No, sorry, I give you four cent. The next day, I give you six cent. Eight cent. Okay, double. Just 30 days. You take one cent. Will you take one cent? One cent. One cent. One cent. Okay, one million now. Raise up your hand. Everybody now, you can. I want everybody to vote. Thank you, sir. Oh, no, you can't even decide. This is what happened to us believers. We are always in a hurry. We go ahead of God. We do not want to wait for his promises. We rather take the best of the option now rather than to wait on God and get the best that he has in stock for us. That was what happened in the life of Joseph. He waited for those years until God said it was the right time for him to get out of the problem, to get to the throne. The same thing with Ruth, the same thing with Elizabeth, the same thing with Daniel, the same with everyone that we spoke about. And the, word, the message for us today is that we should not be anxious about anything. God has every one of us in mind. He has plans for us. He has a good future for everyone. And he is the Alpha, he is the Omega. He knows all things. He knows things that we do not know. He plans things for us. Many people, many of us chose the $1 million a day because we could not calculate quickly. We did not understand what out the one cent we double each day would end at the end of the 30 days. If we knew, we would have waited and said, okay, we'll wait for 30 days. The same thing, because God does not show us everything. It's mystery. And that is why he is God, and that is where we are human beings. If God will show us everything from the beginning to the end, then we will not need God again. We will be God unto ourselves. If God had shown, for example, Joseph, that, look, you are going to be the prime minister, but you are going to go from the pit uh, to, the, to slavery, from slavery to the prison, he would have said, no, God, let me stay with my parents in Canaan. I'm okay here. I can't go through that. I can't wait for 13 years to become the prime minister. The lesson is, brothers and sisters, no matter what you are going through now, 
believe me, those seven things that I mentioned, if you can go back to the video, it's recorded, you want to listen to it again and you want to master it, you will be prepared for the future. No matter what happens to you, you will know it. You will believe it. That Look, it does not matter what I'm seeing. I may not see the finger of God in all these things, but I know that I can trust his heart and that he's walking things around for me. And it's going to happen. Everything has an expiry date. Whatever you're going through has an expiry date and it will end. And whatever you are expecting from God also has a delivery date. It will be delivered. Just believe. Amen. Let us pray. Thank you. Um, Paraventure, there is someone here today. You want to have a relationship with the Lord. You want to say, Lord, I surrender all to you. You are the one that created me. You know everything about me from the beginning till eternity. I want to be your son. If you are here, or maybe you back, backslid, and you are saying, Lord, I want to come back. Like Apostle Paul, I want to know you more. I want to serve you more. I want to do more for you. I want everyone in that category to put your hand in your chest as I do. And pray this prayer after me. Lord, I thank you for being God. I thank you for being the Alpha and the Omega. I thank you for knowing all things. I thank you for creating me in your image. I surrender, I surrender everything about me to you today. Cleanse me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my iniquities. Write my name in the book of life. And I will serve you forevermore. Amen. If you pray that prayer, I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that God will give you the grace to abide with your declaration. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Watch our services online. Visit rccgredemptionhouse.com and click on watch. If you have prayer points and testimonies, write us at Share at rccgredemptionhouse.com Please send your suggestions, concerns, or questions to pastor at rccgredemptionhouse.com And that's it for the announcements. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the service.